I'm Marcel Weeder, host of The Point. On March 7th, Liberals from across Ontario will gather in Mississauga to decide who will be the next leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. Mitzi Hunter, the MPP for Scarborough Guildwood, is one of those candidates. We're chatting with her about her candidacy and her vision for the province and the party. I'm joined today by Mitzi Hunter, the MPP for Scarborough Gilwood. Welcome to the show. And you're a candidate for the leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party. Uh, the, the date is March 7th. It's uh, not that far away. And uh, you're out there. You just told me you flew in from Windsor. So thank you for uh, coming in straight from the airport. Yes, it's uh, it's actually a wonderful way to see our beautiful province and going from riding to riding. Uh, since I announced my leadership uh, in August, I've been to over 80 ridings in this province. And uh, we have an incredible province. We should be very proud. And mm -hmm. I'm in this race uh, to make our province even stronger for the future. Well, let's talk about your background because not everyone knows your background. You came to Canada from Jamaica. You were born, well, you were raised in Scarborough. So tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. So, you know, I'm that unlike, unlikely story. I immigrated to Canada as a small child. Uh, I remember going to kindergarten here, actually, and my my teacher, Mrs. Purden, and how wonderful and, and gentle she was and helping me put my hat and mitts and boots and, and, and jacket on and taking it all off and putting it in my cubby. I remember that. Those are some of my wonderful, fond memories of growing up here. I, we actually moved to Pickering when, when we first came to this country and, and my parents uh, worked very hard. My dad, uh, he was in construction. He, um, mm -hmm. he drove uh, a truck and uh, eventually he owned a, a few of them and, and so he was a small business owner. And my mom, she worked in assembly for the auto um, parts manufacturing oh. that was booming at the time. And this mm -hmm. was in the mid-70s. So, uh, you know, th those are the, the memories that I have of, of growing up. We would always meet for dinner every night and talk about our day as a family. And and of course, you know, you, you have an opportunity to dream. And, and my parents used to say, you're in this country to have a better life. And that's mm -hmm. why we made that journey to come here. And for me, that was through the door of education. And the reason I say I'm the unlikely story, because years later, I became the education minister. And, you know, really only in Ontario is that is that a possibility that, you know, you can come here, work hard, educate yourself and uh, and then run for office and become the education minister. Well, jumping all the way from your kindergarten experience to being Minister of Education, I want to back up a little bit and, and talk about your experience. You talked about the fact that your family would get, gather for family dinners on a regular basis. I know in my family, we used to talk politics. We used to talk about the issues of the day that were in the newspaper or on television. What was it like at, at your family table? Yeah, we used to talk politics too. A lot of it was centered around the Liberals because, you know, Pierre Elliott Trudeau is the Prime mm -hmm. Minister, and uh, and we felt a, a certain loyalty because it was under his leadership that people from the Caribbean were allowed to immigrate here to Canada. You know, my grandmother, Eva Hunter, she came to Canada on a domestic visa. And so, you know, the doors were open because of a progressive liberal government, and, uh, and we never forgot that. And during elections, I remember we would watch as a family the results as they were rolling in and cheer for 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 Pierre Trudeau that's who we were cheering for at the time and did you get involved as a as a young person were you involved in the political process you know, I was actually more involved in advocacy as as a youth um, in high school. I went to Winston Churchill Collegiate in Scarborough, mm -hmm. and I became the student council president. And so I had the opportunity to represent the school, to speak on behalf of students, and to bring people together. So that's what I was always doing 
as uh, as a teenager and and as a young adult is how do I get involved in improving my school or improving my community? Later, I went to the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, of course. I went to Scarborough campus too. Yes, and um, and I started my my colleagues and I uh, on student council started a program called Mosaic, mm. and the reason we started that program was there was a lot of xenophobia in Scarborough at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a very diverse multicultural community, but but all the groups were sort of staying to themselves. They weren't really talking to each other. So we came up with a way to have cultural dialogue and exchange and uh, Mosaic was established. It actually still happens at UTSC 20, 20 years later, two decades later. Wow, that's a testament to, to the organization. Mm -hmm. So you were at Scarborough campus, you did your undergrad degree at U of T, and then you went where? Well, you know, I was a student who, who needed to, I worked to put myself through school. Mm -hmm. So I was always working while studying. So it took me a little longer to finish my undergrad degree. And, uh, and then once I had finished, I then went back and did my master's degree at uh, Rotman. I did an MBA. Mm -hmm. And so how did that prepare you for a career after that? You know, I what I found was that, you know, I started a company when while I was at U of T. Uh, it was a marketing communications company, yeah. and uh, it taught me entrepreneurial skills. It was during a recession. It was the early 1990s when mm -hmm. we had a you know deep recession here in Ontario and, and, and North America. And so, you know, having to create a company out of necessity uh, really taught me core skills. And, uh, and I was able to take that with me throughout my career. I'd like to still think, I think, entrepreneurially in the way that I imagine problems and how to solve them and how to bring people and resources together to achieve and to accomplish things. So I later went on uh, to have a corporate career. I started off in technology, um, in the information communications technology space, and that was, of course, fast growing. I've worked at Bell Canada for a number of years, and then I was the president of an incubator, a technology incubator called Smart Toronto. Um, we worked very down on King Street, if I recall. Uh, Smart Toronto was actually in the Toronto Reference Library. Oh, sorry. Yes, okay. and it, it was a wonderful was... space, a gathering place, and we would work with um, the other incubators in Ontario, in Ottawa, and also Communitech in mm -hmm. uh, in Kitchener Waterloo area, which has flourished and really doing so fabulously now. Um, I remember in the early, early, early days uh, of uh, working with Smart Toronto. Um, John Godfrey and I co-chaired the New Media Village Growth Corporation, which was actually mm. bringing fiber technology to the Leaside community. And, um, and, and we were looking at how do we accelerate the transformation that happens in neighborhoods by the investment of, of broadband technology. And uh, we did projects on King West in the what is now Liberty, Liberty Village, Village right? right? So, but these were early days. This was the early days of live workspaces, and that were highly driven by the growth of our technology sector, which today I'm proud to say is really the second largest cluster in North America. It's second only to Silicon Valley. And I believe it's some of those early organizing that was done on a grassroots level bringing in large corporations where they could invest, but also government where they mm -hmm. could also support the growth of that cluster. But more importantly, creating an environment where startups would flourish and, uh, and grow. So you helped develop the partnerships between the government and corporations and, and incubate those uh, new uh, projects. Yes, that's what I did. I loved doing that, Marcel. I, it's it's something that um, really drives me. In fact, I worked with the City of Toronto, um, their head of economic development, in reviewing Toronto's cluster development strategy. And this, this was very, very early days in looking at economic clusters and what supports them, what causes them to, to thrive, and also importantly, identifying them. And from there, you then took your passions to something called civic action. And describe that because not everyone is familiar with civic action. If they're from outside of the GTA, they may not be familiar with it. Yeah. 
Well, civic action actually was born out of necessity as well uh, for mm -hmm. Toronto. And that was the aftermath of SARS and how it hit um, Toronto really hard in terms of uh, conferences and uh, tourism and, you know, how do you actually bring people back to this city? And um, and so a gathering was formed, um, and this was a long time ago. This was when Mel Lassman was the mayor. Um, and, you know, 100 CEOs were invited to attend this conference at the University of Toronto. And I was one of them because I, at the time I was president of Smart Toronto. So I show up at this gathering and David Pico was speaking. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking about why he loves Toronto and why this is like one of the greatest cities he's ever seen. It captivated me. That type of passion for where you live and for the people who live there. And I wanted to be part of it. So when the, you know, the, the outcome of that gathering was to create an alliance that would act in the best interest of the city and the city region. And I felt that I was one of those people that could act in the best interest of the place that I lived, the place that had given me so much, everything really, as an immigrant who had come here. And that organization has gone on and has done a number of uh, initiatives and has become a very important uh, part of uh, the Toronto economy. It's an absolutely incredibly important part of the Toronto economy. I ended up volunteering for what became known as the Civic Action for a decade before becoming its CEO. And, uh, and then I had an opportunity to lead more formally um, civic action. One of the initiatives we worked on, speaking of an economic driver, was transforming the Greater Toronto Marketing Alliance into Toronto Global so that it would become a more powerful vehicle for investment attraction into the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area economy. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, some people noticed your activism and your history and persuaded you to seek a, an elected position in a by-election uh, to replace Margaret Best, who retired uh, in, in Scarborough Guildwood. Yes. Uh, so while I was leading Civic Action and actually working on an initiative called What Would You Do With 32? We were looking mm -hmm. at how to um, create revenue tools to right. fund the investment in public transit. And um, and that campaign was uh, was something that I, I worked on um, and led uh, on behalf of the organization and, and, and was getting very successful traction and results when you know, we had a new premier appointed, Kathleen Wynne, uh, to to lead the, the Liberal Party and, and the province. And, um, and you know, I got the call from the party to to run in a by-election in Scarborough, where I had grown up and lived, worked, yeah. and, you know, really um, just love my community. I, I had also, um, along the way, I had worked at a couple of other places, Goodwill Industries. Doing, right, you were the vice president of Goodwill. As the vice Goodwill. president, right, doing workforce development. Mm -hmm. How do we create work for people who have disabilities or who have difficulty finding employment? Um, also, Toronto community housing, affordable housing, is so central to the vibrancy of communities. And we know we now are in a housing crisis a across this province. And so- now, And I want to get to that, yeah. but- so, so when I got the call from, from our party, I said, yes. I said, I would stand um, as, a, as a candidate in this riding. And um, I jumped in, um, I won the by-election. Yes. And uh, immediately um, took on a number of different portfolios. Um, I was appointed to be parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Community and Social mm -hmm. Services, uh, the Honorable Ted McNeekin, who was such a fantastic person to work with and to learn from. Um, I worked on a select committee for developmental disabilities and dual diagnoses. Um, and, and that was something that was very close to me because I had worked at Goodwill for seven years and I know um, the families and, uh, and people um, who are born with disabilities who need that support over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. and how do we provide that support in this province? And, and so, um, you know, it was, uh, it was an incredible 
time to get into politics and to get into government. Within a year of winning the by-election, the general election was called in 2014. You, you got to repeat it all over and again. I got to repeat it all over again. I had to knock on all the doors again. <laughs> And, uh, but you, this time they knew who you were. Yes, this time they knew who I was, Marcel, and I won my riding uh, the second time by over by fifty percent. You had a large number. Yes. And then, the last election, was a nail biter. Yeah. You won by less than a hundred votes. Yeah. yeah. And you were part of the uh, fabulous seven, yes. or the magnificent seven, yeah. as they as they called themselves. Yeah. What a, a an incredible um, moment, you know, I, and I remember the moment because I was with my, all the people who supported me, all the volunteers, my family, and we didn't know if I would win my seat, you know, because it was that close. And it turned out that I won by 74 votes. What a testament to democracy. Every vote counts. Every vote matters. And, you know, it's the people in my riding who are the reason that I am elected and that I continue to serve in this way as an MPP. Just to put it in context for, for people who are either watching or listening, that's less than one vote per poll. Yes, it is. That's the difference. That's one different. vote in each of the over 100 polls in your riding, yeah. that's what made the difference. That's right. And, you know, I, I meet every day uh, that I am in my riding, I meet someone who voted for me. And I really feel that they're one of my 74. I feel actually a closeness to the individual voters in my riding as a result of that election. When you win by thousands, you're not really sure why you won. But when you win by less than 100 votes, you know it's the people who made that choice to reelect you. Mm -hmm. Let me go back a little bit. You were also uh, the Minister of Education. Yeah. And you also uh, were also the Minister for uh, Comsoc uh, Community. Uh, so, well, sorry. actually, I started off sorry. as the Associate, so Associate Minister, Minister of Finance Fin okay. and uh, responsible for the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. That's right. The, the ORPP. Pre yes, yes, the premier appointed you to yes. uh, stick handle that yes. issue because dealing with the federal government over changes to the Canada Pension Plan, Ontario wanted to uh, wanted to go its own way, mm -hmm. and and so the premier appointed you to to be the lead on that issue. Yes, and what a fantastic way to join cabinet. A, a very focused issue highly technical and complex and difficult, really. Um, and going up against Stephen Harper, who refused at the time to expand CPP, even though benefits coverage was shown to be inadequate. And a small change would mean a great benefit for many working Canadians. And uh, and so we, we started to uh, build our own pension plan. I had an opportunity to travel the country and to talk to finance ministers in each province about um, what Ontario was doing because it's very important that Ontario continues to be a leader in Canada. And, uh, and we wanted to be very transparent and open with the work that we were doing. And it gave me a, a unique lens and perspective into Ontario's place and uh, and really the leadership role as the most populous province that we have in Canada. And uh, and that led to eventually uh, when the government was changed and Prime Minister Trudeau came in and his government agreed to expand CPP. Um, so it, it was a, a tremendous victory for us to really stand up for hardworking Ontarians and really all Canadians to now see that CPP is a stronger entity and that people are going to be getting more benefits in their retirement years when they really need it. So that's something that Ontarians and Actually, all Canadians can thank mm -hmm. you and yes. Premier, former Premier Wynne yes. for the leadership in ensuring those types of changes were made mm -hmm. that would benefit uh, all Canadians, yes. not just Ontarians, but right across the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me, obviously, that, that's a very proud uh, example that, that you've given. But what else are you proud of uh, during your term as either as a minister or as a uh, member of uh, the government? Well, certainly um, having the honor to serve as Minister of Education 
uh, I was the first person of color in the history of our province to be appointed as Minister of Education. And, um, you know, one of the commitments that I had when I was minister was to visit one school every week because I wanted to be mm-hmm. in the space where students were learning. And it's a remarkable um, thing to to witness, you know, when students uh, understand uh, what what they're being taught and they're engaged in their learning. And we have one of the best education systems in the world because we've invested in that system over a, a number of years. But we cannot rest on our laurels. We have to move forward. We have to get better. And we have to make sure that young people are prepared for the world in which they live in and that they will lead. I can't not ask the question, obviously, is that there's currently negotiations going on with the various uh, teachers union, education workers unions, uh, with the current government who has decided to increase the average class size, uh, introduce e-learning, and a number of other uh, initiatives. Give us your take as a former minister of education on that. And I know you've spoken in the legislature on this issue and, and uh, quizzed the government on it, but maybe you can share some of your thoughts here. Well, what's disappointing about the Ford government's approach to education is that they're going it alone. They're not collaborating with education partners. And that's, I, I believe, the wrong thing. As minister, as a former minister of education, I really felt that people were coming to the table with the best interest of the students in mind. And that's how I built consensus. I would always say that the goal here is what is in the best interest of our students. And so every table that I convened, whether it was negotiations, because I had to negotiate all of the extension agreements that were now uh, on the table with all the unions and and did that successfully. And and I believe that we were able to do that because we kept the best interest of our students in mind. So going it alone and, uh, and making unilateral decisions is not the way to go. It's less than collaborative. We've got to make sure that the decisions that are being made that affect students and their learning are done in a way that actually enhances their learning. E-learning is a terrific idea. I was the minister that actually announced the commitment for broadband for our schools. Uh, My commitment was one meg per second per student as a standard that we would uh, have in Ontario. And we began to roll that out across rural communities, northern communities, and all of our, our cities and towns. So I believe in technology. I actually have a technology well, that's background. That's your background, that's my yes. my background. And, and I know it's the future. So our Ontario students have to be ready to compete. And so technology is important. But are we ready for e-learning? How, how are we going to facilitate broadband access in rural and northern communities where there is no internet or it's, it's a slow service? Are we creating an imbalance and inequities in our school system by making this mandatory before our boards are even ready? And, uh, and so those are the questions that we don't have answers to based on mm-hmm. the direction that this government has set all on their own without any consultation. We also know that they have a survey. It's their own survey that parents have filled in that says that they don't agree with raising class sizes and I having think mandatory. Something like over 66%, two thirds of uh, parents have yes. rejected that. Yeah. But they haven't made this, uh, this study public yet. They haven't made the study public. Perhaps it doesn't look favorably on their policy, but they're in the middle of a negotiation. And if you're going to bargain in good faith, you have to make information transparently available to your bargaining partners. And so it's some of these decisions that the Ford government has made that's really setting up a tense, combative environment in the education system. And uh, and I don't believe that that's in the best interest of students or parents uh, or our system. Mm-hmm. So one of uh, your your colleagues has uh, proposed amalgamating the uh, Catholic uh, school system with the broader public system. What are your thoughts as a former minister having to be responsible for the, the 
four various boards that uh, come under Ontario's uh, jurisdiction? Well, I actually believe that we have an excellent education system right now with the four boards and the current configuration that we have. We have a long-standing historical commitment um, to the to maintaining the Catholic system it's part of our constitutional commitments mm -hmm. and um, and so we're honoring that and I, I think that that's okay because the system is an excellent one students are being very well served by the system that we have in both French and English and uh, you know and I know that because my younger brother actually went to Catholic school in Scarborough mm. All the way from elementary, high school, and he even actually eventually went to a Catholic university in the United States on a basketball scholarship, and yeah. uh, and so he re received that very very good education, and uh, and I see how it has helped to shape him into an outstanding young man. You know, I went to the public system all mm -hmm. the way through. We've just described uh, you know all yeah. the, the education <laughs> that I've received in this in this province. And, uh, and I think it turned know, out pretty turn, good. I'd out say. Pretty good. I think yeah. it's doing OK. And and so, you know, I, I what I want to see us focus on is how do we get real outcomes for improving the level of education in our province? How do we focus on, you know, things like STEM, science, technology, engineering and math? And, and arts, actually, STEAM. STEAM, steam is, yeah. I was just going to ask you that. Yeah, it needs to be STEAM. How do we focus on that so that, that our students are well prepared and they're learning the things that, that at the end of the day that they and their parents want them to learn because they're going to be able to, you know, get a good job at the end of this. So just recently, within the last two weeks, the PISA results were released. Uh, for those who are not familiar, it's a international scoring of education systems uh, across uh, a number of different countries. And it turns out that this this time, it's done every three years, this, this uh, round, Ontario's ranking actually improved. Yes. And we're now seeing something close to 89%, I believe, of uh, or 82 percent of uh, students uh, graduating uh, and, and possibly going on to either university, college or skilled trades? Yeah, it's actually as high as 87 percent. 87, 87. Okay. And uh, the reason I, I'm, I'm watching that number, because I, I believe that under the Liberals, we invested in education. You know, we inherited an education system that was in disarray, was not invested in, and almost a third of students were not graduating before the Liberals. And, you know, I can definitely say, because I was education minister uh, when we hit 86.5%, and it continues to gradually rise in terms of graduation rates. Very proud of that number, because that means that young people are moving on uh, to live productive lives. And, you know, it's, it's, it is about their pathway beyond high school. You know, are they going into post-secondary in terms of college or university for further um, training? Are they getting into the trades, which are great professions in this province? And and there's a skills uh, shortage in the trades. In fact, uh, in Windsor, I was just there. Um, they're building the Gordie Howe Bridge. And, and my understanding is that um, they are short of people to work on that project and are constantly looking for qualified people. And so we, we, we want to, uh, we want to see that in our province and uh, we want to continuously invest in our education system to raise graduation rates. I have a bold vision. Um, you know, as should I lead the Ontario Liberal Party and become Ontario's next premier to get our graduation rates to 90%? And uh, and that rise, and I know that the Conference Board of Canada has uh, put out a study, and uh, OSSTF has um, the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation has endorsed that report, where an in, a one dollar invested in our education system uh, returns a dollar seven back. Actually, it's a dollar thirty. It's a dollar thirty. Okay. A dollar thirty. Okay. Is what uh, the Conference Board study. Uh, shows that's an even better return, and it also shows that uh, the province would save money in health care, in the justice system, and in social services. Aside from the dollar thirty that is immediately returned yeah. to the economy. So, so in my view, it's the foundation. It is from which we build our future. 
is investments in education. And, uh, and, and my plan that I've put forward for education, it focuses on the academics and on, on improving outcomes, that 90% graduation rate. But it also focuses on the whole student, that whole learner, making sure that there's an environment in our school system that's positive, that fosters well-being for students and our education workers uh, so that, you know, we can have that balance. Uh, I'm definitely focused on the mental health and wellness of students, uh, bringing back OHIP plus and, and including mental health supports for everyone under the age of 30 to, uh, to make sure that they have the supports when and where they need them. I want to see uh, a mental health professional in every high school so that when students are in need of that support, that they have it available to them in the school. So let's pivot and talk about your broader plans as to be a liberal leader. You talked about your education platform. Let's expand on that and let's learn a little bit more about what you see as your vision for the province and for the party. Well, I, I'm very excited about it. Um, it's uh, it's something that I believe is needed at this time. When you think about um, our world, our province, there's uncertainty there. You know, there's mm -hmm. a changing economy. Uh, there's automation, AI, um, robotics, a lot of disruption. Forty percent of the jobs that we have today in our economy will not be there in ten years. Um, you know, just automation and artificial intelligence will take over. What does that mean for Ontario? How do we prepare for that future? And certainly, everything we've talked about in education is to prepare us for that future. Because these young people will, in fact, create the, the future that we're imagining. They will be the skilled and the talented individuals that will solve our most difficult challenges and create our biggest opportunities. And so we've got to make sure that our post-secondary education system is also going to be adapting to the needs that are changing. Micro-credentials, upskilling, reskilling, all of those things we have to be prepared for um, to make sure that our population is thriving in that future. So let me go down a little further. You talked about the fact that there's going to be a change in terms of the economy and terms of the types of jobs that are going to be out there. But Ontario historically has been the manufacturing center of Canada. And with a lot of that manufacturing jobs disappearing, we've seen what's happened in the auto sector. We've seen it's happened in a number of others. Where do you see Ontario's economy going and how are we going to get to where you want to see us? I I actually I I was very disappointed when uh, GM announced that it was closing uh, Oshawa, and the Premier Ford just threw up his hands. He said the ship has sailed. That's not the type of leadership that I would expect. I expect leaders to lead, and when times are are difficult or there's a change, that's when you actually come forward with new ideas. And so my vision for the um, is actually to create, and this is uh, something that I announced, uh, a ministry for technology, advanced manufacturing, and autom automotive. Because I believe that the future for automotive is actually embedded in research and development and in technology. And, and it is something that Ontario is well positioned to have a leadership role not only in Canada and North America, but globally. And uh, I would like to see in 2023, a year after I win the 2022 election, should I win the leadership of the party, a summit, a global summit that invites all of the leading auto producers around the world, the top 20 producers nationally, um, to come forward and uh, convene in Ontario, in Southwest Ontario, in fact, the heartland of our manufacturing and our industrial base. And to talk about what is the future for this industry? How does it lead the green revolution that is needed? And whether that's in electric vehicles or in other forms of, uh, of technology that is adapted, that can um, drive us forward, convene that here 
in Ontario and let us lead that conversation. Let us figure out where this industry is going and help to create that reality. So that's that's all very well and good, mm -hmm. but there's going to be parts of the province that aren't suited to that manufacturing vision. Sure. We've got Northern Ontario that have a lot of resources, but don't have any manufacturing. We have rural Ontario, which still provides a lot of the agricultural components that we rely on in cities. Yeah. So how do you address uh, that? Uh, there's the forestry sector, there's a number of other sectors that right. are not necessarily tuned into that vision that you just uh, shared with us. So so my vision, it, it can work well regionally. I talk about the Southwest because I actually believe that we need to pull the innovation that is happening from Toronto to along the 401, in fact, from the Toronto. 401 corridor, the yes. 401 corridor, Toronto, Kitchener-Waterloo. Let's pull that to the Southwest, right down through London and into um, Windsor, right? Let's make sure that that's a robust built on technology, built on the future, built on real products and services that people need and want, and they see that Ontario is the leader in that. That is my vision for that corridor. I visited the North. You know, I, I went up to Timmins and I visited ACOM, which is mm -hmm. a mill yeah. that's been continuously operating uh, in Northern Ontario for a hundred years. I think they only shut down twice because of two fires, but other than that, they've been continuously operating. Harvesting our natural resources, also doing it in a sustainable way because they themselves recognize that. But innovation is also happening in that sector as well and is very much needed. So we're not just innovating because we're in the GTA or in um, an advanced manufacturing base. We're innovating wherever we are um, producing in Ontario. And so that cluster strategy of how do we connect our, um, our companies with our institutions, uh, our academic institutions, uh, colleges, universities, and our training is really important because one of the things that I know um, companies and managers tell me is that access to skilled and talented individuals are is critical. Whether you're in a small business, a medium-sized business, or you're in an international company, you're looking for the be best talent. And that skill shortage is not unique to Ontario. It's something that's happening globally. So the core investment is in education, at all levels, all the way from K to 12 through to post-secondary, our universities and colleges, making sure that we maintain that pipeline of talent uh, for our industries and creating environments in our regions where our economic clusters can continue to flourish and thrive and change and adapt to the new environments and the new realities. So continuing on that vein, there's the issue of the urban-rural divide. Mm -hmm. Ontario has now become more of an urban province than a rural. Uh, most people live in cities, and so there's challenges in the cities. Yet rural Ontario has its own set of issues in terms of access to services, access to health care, access to education. How do you see dealing with that issue? I'd like to end the isolation that I see in rural Ontario. And I want to do that by connecting people to jobs and people to institutions and back home again. So a young person growing up in rural Ontario, if they want to move forward with their lives and get access to education, oftentimes they leave home. But it's very difficult for them to find their way back it, they literally just can't get there. There's poor bus services. Um, there's certainly not rapid ways of getting there or um, cost-effective ways of getting there. And so we've got to have a rural Ontario that is linked and connected in two ways. By broadband infrastructure, we need to build out that network and get those communities connected, as well as transit and transportation links that make sense, that connect people to jobs and institutions and so that they can find their way back home. I also um, recognize that rural Ontario 
It is our fabulous agricultural base here in this province, which we are so known for. But there is also fishing, forestry. Um, there are all sorts of other industries that are happening as well. And I believe by, by making the, the right connections with broadband and transit links, that we will unlock the capacity that is available to us in our small towns and our rural communities. And that's, that's part of my vision as well, is to make sure that we're a fully integrated and connected province and that we're prospering from our north through rural and in, in our urban centers. You're a politician from Scarborough. Yes. One of the issues that is perennial is transit. Yes. And the this government is, uh, well, actually it was your previous government that uh, proved a subway connection into uh, Scarborough, mm -hmm. an expansion, a full uh, subway system. And as well, there's now the GO uh, connection that all day, two way uh, go, and I believe in your riding, you have actually a yeah. station. Guildwood is, yeah. is one of those uh, stations. What's your vision in terms of dealing with transit? Because a lot of people, whether they're in Toronto or Hamilton or elsewhere, always have an issue. I was talking with uh, one of your former uh, colleagues it took uh, him over three hours to get from Brantford to Toronto. Mm. And that type of the, you know time delay just doesn't work for a lot of people to spend three hours in each direction. Yeah. So everyone knows me as the subway champion and mm -hmm. as the champion of transit. You know, as I mentioned to you, I was doing that before I entered politics uh, as the CEO of Civic Action. I was championing transportation um, with the What Would You Do with 32 campaign. And that was all about quality of life. Because if you're stuck in gridlock, you're not doing the things that are meaningful to you. You're literally just wasting time. And that waste of time has real dollars associated with it. Billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. Billions and billions of dollars of lost productivity. And so we have to solve that. So running for leadership of the Ontario Liberal Party and for premier of this province, you will know that Mitzi will be a champion of investments in public transit. And that is multimodal. It includes the expansion of our subway systems. It includes building light rail transit. I was just in Ottawa and, uh, and rode their light rail line. And I actually rode it during rush hour which clearly shows to yeah. me that they are already um, stretching the limits of the capacity of that system. Build and, it and they will and, use it. And they will use it and they probably need to continue to build and invest and link their network. I'm, I'm a real believer in those links, making sure that it's a network that we're creating and that we have a network of transit links locally in communities because you have to connect people from their home to the hubs and then for those hubs have to be connected um, to more rapid uh, so what does that look like rapid uh, transportation you, you've, you've, you mentioned Ottawa yes. and Toronto. Oh, Toronto how are they going to link up because right now it's via rail is the only way or bus or car and of course obviously air but you, you've got some linkages to other cities, and especially if you're talking about technology hubs, uh, Waterloo and the innovation corridor between Kitchener-Waterloo and Toronto, there are a number of uh, places that yeah. uh, need to be linked in Hamilton, Windsor, London, Kingston. How are all those areas going to so, link up? And, and it's going to link up with a variety of different, in a variety of different ways. Um, so definitely the go network we need to continuously invest in it expand it uh, you mentioned the guild would go in my riding uh, we added a third track to that to make sure that there are there's no slow pinch points along the lakeshore line mm -hmm. um, and and because we were doing that we re remade the the line to the the station itself so that it now accommodates cycling uh, so people can ride to the station, park uh, their bike, or take it on and and go to where they need to go. 
Um, we also need to make sure that those key economic zones like Kitchener-Waterloo and even out to London and Windsor uh, area, as I mentioned, that they are connected as well. That we recognize the routes in which people need to travel so that they can live and work where they want to in this province, but they're fully connected. Well, people this government uh, canceled the study that your government mm -hmm. initiated for a rapid transit, well, not rapid transit, but high speed, high speed yeah. uh, between Toronto and Windsor mm -hmm. in, in that corridor. Yeah. Would you be willing to reestablish that? I would absolutely be willing to, uh, to reestablish it with the proviso that we do consultations uh, with the community and develop a master plan for that size of an investment. If you're going to invest $20 billion, we want to make sure that there is a master plan of how we're going to link up the Southwest West region to Toronto. And I believe that there is an airport link um, planned for that as well. And that we fully- Union Station West is what they're calling it. Right. And that we fully um, plan for the growth that will will result in that in type of investment. But I, I believe that um, Ontario uh, needs to be world class in our transit and our transportation systems. And having a program under my leadership, it would be to continuously build out these projects and uh, and to make sure that we have the evidence underneath it. So, so that these investments will get us the return that we're looking for. Transit is closely associated with climate change. Mm -hmm. Getting people to use mass transit means that they would leave their cars at home and rely on public transit to get them to where they need to be. Yeah. Let me ask you about climate change. This government has decided to cancel the carbon uh, cap and trade program it uh, is at odds and, and it's actually suing the federal government uh, over its uh, carbon tax issue. Where do you fit into all of this? The climate is uh, our number one priority. When you talk to young people, uh, that's what they tell me. There, there are two priorities they have, climate change and affordable housing. And when it comes to climate change, we have to make sure that Ontario has a strategy in place to protect the climate and the environment for future generations. And there's no question that we need that. The Auditor General has already said that this government has a poor climate plan. It does not meet um, the standards in terms of reducing GHG emissions to meet the climate, the, the Paris Accord, and uh, and we're falling short. This after they've canceled cap and trade, they fired the environmental commissioner, and they're canceling green contracts and paying hundreds of million, millions of dollars in order to do that. We are going in the absolute wrong direction when it comes to being responsible stewards of our environment under the Ford government. What we need is to have a robust climate plan in Ontario that gets us to reducing those GHGs and making our commitment to the, the Paris Climate Accord, which means that we have to be far more aggressive with our targets than where they are today. So how would you get there? Well, we've just been talking about the investments in transit and transportation and giving people that alternative to get out of their cars and onto public transit. I want to do that in a way that continuously builds capacity across our networks and our regions, linking our small towns and our communities uh, to larger hubs. I also want to see fair integration. I want to build a system so that people can um, just have the ease of commuting where where it's not something that's difficult for them to do because it's too costly or too time consuming. That there's just an ease of commuting because it is a network. We also have to, you know, we have to do things as simply as plant more trees in communities and, and to make sure that we have a continuous way of doing that. That's our carbon sink that will 
pull out those GHGs. So that's something that we na- we have to have a robust uh, way that we continuously plant more trees into our environment. I'm also very concerned about our water systems. Our Great, Le- Great Lakes is our jewel in Ontario. And how do we protect that those water systems clean up areas uh, where we have those algae blooms and and make sure that we keep our waters, our fresh water that's so precious to us here in Ontario, clean and accessible for future generations. There's more that we can do, um, especially uh, producers and and giving them incentives uh, to be carbon neutral and uh, and to have a more of a circular economy that they're recycling um, their their products and the services that that they produce so that um, we are moving towards that carbon neutral environment. When I was the CEO of Civic Action, uh, we we actually had a number of environmental initiatives that uh, that were underway. The race to reduce was incenting commercial office providers uh, to in multi-unit buildings to reduce their electricity consumption. Um, we had uh, neighborhoods that were competing for carbon neutrality that mm. was being driven by our Emerging Leaders Network and our young people. So there are ways of getting people involved in saving the planet, recognizing that we're in a climate crisis and it's all of our responsibilities uh, to do our part. Retrofitting buildings to make them, uh, to seal um, the outside of those buildings. And, uh, you know, we have an aging housing stock um, in many parts of Ontario. I have a housing plan and a housing strategy that takes into consideration um, how do we, you know, maintain uh, the housing stock that we have because we know that we need more supply, but we also need to keep the, the supply that we have in good, in, in a good state of repair and uh, in thinking of our environment as, as we do that. On that theme of housing, you mentioned a few moments ago that two issues dominate young people's concerns. One is climate mm-hmm. and the other is housing affordability. We just, you just raised the issue, so I'm going to pick up on that and say, how are young people going to fare under a hunter-led government? Well, this is kind of an okay boomer moment because millennials need housing too. And we've got to recognize that. A lot of our housing policy, housing design has been built for the boomer generation. Millennials want different type of housing, different access to housing. Um, they want to be in neighborhoods that are transit oriented, that's close to public transit, walkable and livable. They want a housing environment that has that. Um, so services and, and those restaurants and, and amenities that, that they enjoy. And so we've got to think about that in how we design our housing policy. Uh, so my housing plan has a number of uh, innovative ideas. And you were, ideas. you were the former CEO of uh, the community housing in Toronto. Right. I was the chief administrative officer. Or CAO, so, sorry. CAO. CAO. So, but no, I know the but, value of affordable housing uh, to communities and how important it is and the tensions that arise when you don't have it. So student housing is something that I'm advocating that we build. There are, because, you know, as, as you know, I'm the education um, champion and the education and the economy. Well, in order to do that, people need an affordable, accessible place to live um, while they're studying. And uh, and so if we build more student housing, then the the remaining housing remains affordable for, for families who, who need to live there as well. And there are many communities in the province where uh, affordable housing affordability is at a crisis point. And even in places that you would not think of naturally, it's not just in Toronto. Um, Waterloo. And in Waterloo. Has, Stratford. I right? was, was in Stratford and we were talking about, um, you know, they need a spectrum of housing. Uh, because they they have you know a, a good stock in in single family homes, but they don't have homes for um, you know smaller size homes. And you know one of the things that I'm advocating for is co living. So mm-hmm. you know there was a gentleman that I spoke to in Stratford who has a five bedroom house, uh, but he he and his wife no longer need that size of a home. But they also can't afford to necessarily sell their home and replace it with something newer um, because the, the cost of housing is just mm-hmm. prohibitive. So why not 
create a co-living arrangement for someone like that, where they can devise that house and, uh, and someone else could move in there and, uh, and share share the space. I saw there was in, I'm not sure if it was in North Bay or somewhere up north where seniors are now co-living. Yes. Three or four are sharing a, a shared house and yes. they're able to support each other yes. as well as making it more affordable for them. Yeah. So I want to have housing policies that really support that kind of uh, way of living. Uh, it's happening in other places in the world, in Denmark, in San Francisco, and there's no reason why it can't happen here in Ontario. Maybe build in some incentives uh, to help with those retrofits and, uh, and to really encourage that because that will uh, incrementally increase the supply. I also think that we need to do something about um, you know the uh, Airbnb type uh, housing that's uh, that's being used uh, in a particular way by homeowners, but that keeps those uh, units away from being rented. Mm. And so putting um, a tax on that uh, will help to create a pool that we can continuously build more affordable housing from. Now, when you were the CAO uh, for community housing in Toronto, one of the issues, and it's still a, an issue, is that of uh, violence in, you know, in and around uh, those communities. Uh, gun violence uh, over the last few years has become an issue. Mayor Tory is uh, trying to address that. How do you see the province's role in responding to that? Well, I actually believe that the province needs to take a leadership role. I've uh, put forward two private members bills that deal with gun violence. My first bill was to ban the sale of handgun ammunition. I don't see the need for handgun ammunition um, floating around on, on our urban streets. Um, and, uh, and then my second bill is making gun violence a public health issue. Um, the Toronto mm. Board of Health has actually adopted my bill and is recommending that the province of Ontario pass the bill. Uh, I just met with the Ottawa Board of Health, and they are also supportive of this bill. So, you know, looking at it through a public health lens really uh, shows you the areas that we need to pay attention to to end the cycles of violence. We need to make sure that people have trauma-informed counselling. Um, this is something that I encountered when I was researching my first bill, that many um, uh, individuals that uh, were, were in uh, areas that crime has occurred, that type of violent crime has occurred, or who have experienced it, don't have access to trauma-informed counseling. We've got to make sure that that is addressed. Hospital-based intervention and community-based intervention programs is also something that is important because when an incident happens, oftentimes a community is open to hearing what needs to be changed. You know, sadly, Marcel, in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, two young people from the same high school fell victim to violence um, and lost their lives, one on his graduation day. I remember speaking at his graduation and telling the young people that choices matter. You know, I was trying to say to them, choose the right road and the right path, work hard and achieve the things you want to achieve in life. You know, and I was very sad to hear that that very evening, this young man, on you know, just near where he lived, was shot and killed. Tragic. It was so tragic. You know, we all know what happened on Danforth. Randomized violence, uh, not targeted in a neighborhood, because that's actually not what, what's happening. Uh, what's happening is that it's becoming more brazen. And, uh, and, and in, in areas that are just uh, unusual for violence to occur, like on the Danforth. So we, to safeguard and to protect our communities and to be free of gun violence, we have to be proactive. Making it a public health concern allows us to invest in the preventative programs that will end this and break this cycle. Let me shift the conversation away from policies and talk about politics okay. and talk about the Ontario Liberal Party in the last little while that we have. The voters gave out a very strong message to the Ontario Liberal Party. What did you take away from that evening? Well, the main thing I took away, um, uh, just, and, and I see it, you know, I visited over 80 ridings 
uh, since I announced my leadership in August. Um, from north, rural, everything we've been talking about is actually I've 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 been I've experienced I've talked to people I've knocked on doors. The Ontario Liberal Party had stopped listening. That is the consistent message that I hear. And uh, and maybe after 15 years of uh, of governing, um, maybe we drifted away from those grassroots. And I want us to get back there. I've committed. Uh, so how do we get there? Yeah, what what's the sure. hunter plan to do that? So one of the first things that I, I said right out of the gate was let's knock on a million doors together, revitalize our local riding associations, empower our local riding associations, create an opportunity for us as a liberal family to go and talk to our neighbors, listen to them, hear what they have to say. Listen to those who don't even agree with you. I was at a coffee shop in Windsor and, um, you know, a a brother and a sister who were actually having a bit of trouble with the healthcare system started talking to me. They were actually from another party. They were, they were from the NDP party, in Mm -hmm. fact, Uh, but they liked what I was saying about making investments in home care, in caregiver support, recognizing those who care the most for their loved ones, sometimes need some support themselves and recognizing that we can do more to support those caregivers. We have a stress on our our healthcare system. Um, You know, hospital beds are few and far between in many uh, emergency rooms and uh, and other beds. Long-term care, high, high demand for long-term care with our aging population. So, in order to satisfy all of those concerns, what are the priorities? Let's hear from Ontarians how we're going to prioritize the needs in our population and in our community. And one of the things that Ontarians can rely on is that a progressive, cent- centrist, liberal government is going to act and take bold decisions that meet the need of Ontarians. Their key priority needs, health care, education, the environment, the economy. These are the things that we are known for and under my leadership that we will refocus on. Some people have criticized the party as shifting too far to the left of the political spectrum. Mm-hmm. Where do you see, do you see that the party shift to the left was an appropriate one or do you think that the party should maintain more of a centrist approach? Well, Marcel, I mean, I come with a balance, right? I worked at Goodwill mm-hmm. and I also have an MBA. So I, I, have the, I have both perspectives that I can weigh and use judgment because there are times when you do need to provide additional supports. You know, like, for instance, the consideration of a basic income. When you, when you look at all the disruption that will happen in our economy due to automation and AI, we're not talking about poverty at that point. We're talking about middle class jobs that are being disrupted. We're talking about bridging an economy into a new economy. And sometimes you have to provide those income stability and support in order for people to make that transition. And we want them to make that transition because we want our economy to continue to do well while the changes are happening. So there are times when you need to embrace those types of programs. At the same time, we have to be able to afford it. And my vision is that Ontario will be a thriving economy. Our economy will grow and expand. People will have good jobs. People will be able to purchase the things that they need. And so the revenues in the province will grow as a result of that economic expansion. The party itself is mired in a six or seven million dollar debt. And that seems to be handcuffing its ability to go out and share its message with Ontarians. How do you feel that you're going to be able to address that to overcome this debt that's out there and grow the party? Well, you know, like I've always done, you know, I've been a leader, I've been a CEO and, um, and have the background in the education where, 
uh, making sure, it, you know, our party is almost very similar to a, a small and business, really, in terms of its um, operations, the size of its operations, and the need to fundraise for campaigns. Um, and we're going to do that by growing the base of the party. You know, I championed openness and fairness in our party with one member, one vote. And one of the reasons I did that is that I actually believe we need to grow the base of our party. We need to be that great big red tent that people feel that they belong. Um, people from all sides of the political spectrum can find a place in the Ontario Liberal Party to represent the things that they value and that they want to see happen under a progressive liberal government. And so from that base, we will raise the money that we need for our party. We have to become more modern. We have to become younger as a party. I truly uh, believe that. And uh, and welcome people in, bring people in. And uh, of course, they will invest in the party and contribute to the party um, through their local ridings, through their local communities. And our party will be healthy and thriving under a Mitzi Hunter leadership. On that note, I'd like to thank you for stopping by and sharing some thoughts with us. I've been chatting with Mitzi Hunter, the MPP for Scarborough Guildwood and candidate for the Liberal leadership. Thank you for joining us on The Point.